Let us pray first. Our gracious God and loving Heavenly Father, we are so thankful, Lord, that this morning we can worship you in spirit and in truth. We thank you, Lord, for this privilege of studying your word. May you give us wisdom as we ponder upon this, and we acknowledge the Holy Spirit will be our teacher today. May you speak to us. And so, Father, we also commit to you that right now, the nurses are taking the board exam. May you give them wisdom, O God. May you bless them as they take the board exam this morning. And we ask your prayers upon them that they may be able to remember the lessons that they learned. And above all, may be able to pass the exam, dear Lord. So we commit to you, all the nurses this morning. Bless them and guide them today. And so, Father, we continue to worship you this morning. May you give us wisdom as we study your word. May you prepare our hearts and minds that we may be able to understand your word this morning. So speak to us. We commit all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Our message this morning is very simple. Okay? Very basic, yet it is so important because it has to do a lot of our growth in our Christian life. So if you have your Bibles with you, kindly open it to the book of Second Timothy. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 14 down to verse 17. I know a lot of you knows this already. Our topic is about the authority of the Word of God. But at the back of my mind, I have also doubts that there are some Christians who are ignorant of the Word of God. And so this morning, I hope that the Lord will speak to you. May we be reminded by the Word of God this morning and allow ourselves to teach us from the Word of God. May I request everyone to stand, please, as we give reverence to the Holy Word of God. Let us read together 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14 down to verse 17. Ready now? Begin. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Thank you. Please be seated. We have the happy privilege of spending our time on how to study the Bible. Okay? I repeat. We have the happy privilege of spending our time on how to study the Bible. Unlike other countries, Bible is restricted. Right? They cannot bring their Bible. They cannot use their Bible. They cannot read their Bible. Otherwise, they will be dead. Whereas, here in the Philippines, we have freedom to use, to bring, to read, and study our Bible. So, in this introduction of mine, we have the happy privilege of spending our time on how to study our Bible. For every Christian, it is really vital that you should know how to study your Bible. Okay? That you be able to dig into God's Word yourself, to glean and to gain the riches that are there. I often think of the words of Jeremiah. 
If you have your Bibles with you, kindly open it in Jeremiah 15, 16. Jeremiah 15, 16, it says, Thy words were found, I did eat them, and thy word was my source of joy and rejoicing. Okay? Let's stop there. This is not literal that Jeremiah, he ate the word of God. Okay? But in the Hebrew, translated into English, the word, the words were found and I did eat them. It means Jeremiah read the word of God. Or he meditate the word of God. And as he read or meditate the word of God, he found out that the word of God was the source of his strength, the source of his joy, and the source of his rejoicing. Now, have you experienced that in your Christian life? Do you have desire for the word of God? Are you craving from the word of God in your life? I hope so. Okay? But if you don't have this desire or craving from the word of God, I think, and I'm sorry to tell you, I think there is something wrong with your relationship with the Lord. You know what? The person who is truly saved, he is really craving from the word of God. I hope you have that level on your maturity right now. So whether you like it or not, beloved and the Lord, we need the word of God in our life. So the word of God, again, is a tremendous thing. Okay? No Christian should be handicapped in his own ability to study the word or to study God for himself or for herself. And so I want, first of all, that we should discuss why is it important to study the Bible. Okay? But before that, let me give you this illustration. Walter Scott was a great Christian. When he was dying, he said to his secretary, Bring me the book. And the secretary went to his library and saw thousands of books there. And he was confused. And he came back to Dr. Scott and said, Sir, what book or which book? And Dr. Scott said, replied, The book, the Bible, the only book for a dying man. Now, I would like to add that statement of Dr. Scott. The Bible is not only the book for a dying man, but the Bible is also the book for a living man. Why? Because the Bible is the word of life as well as the hope in death. Okay? And so as we come to the Word of God this morning with tremendous sense of excitement and anticipation, let me share with you to begin with in this study something about the authority of the Word of God. The authority of the Word of God. And so first of all, let me say this, that the simple meaning of the Bible is the Word of God. Right? This is not man's opinion. This is not human philosophy. This is not somebody's ideas. This is not pulling the best thoughts of the best men in this world. But the Bible is the Word of God. And so this morning, there are several things I would like to share with you. These are very simple, very basic, 
but is very important in our Christian life. Number one, the Bible is infallible. It is infallible. In total, the Bible has no mistakes. In its original autographs, it is without error. Proof. What's the proof? Open your Bibles, please. Psalm 19.7. In Psalm 19.7, the Word of God says here, or the Bible says itself, the law of the Lord is perfect. The law of the Lord is perfect. Let me stop there. The law, from the Hebrew translated into English, it means the Word of God. The Scripture. So you see, the Word of God is perfect. The law of the Lord is perfect. It is flawless. In fact, it has to be. Why? Because it was authored by God, who is flawless. So the Bible is the ultimate authority. You see, the fact that God is perfect demands that the original autograph, the original giving of the Word of God must in and of itself also must be perfect. So again, we say to begin with that the Bible is infallible. Infallible. And that's the first reason why we're going to study it. Why? Because it is the only book that has never makes a mistake. That's our Bible. Everything it says is the truth. Okay? Number two, not only the Bible is infallible, but secondly, it is inerrant. The Bible is inerrant. Alright? Not only infallible in total, but inerrant in its parts. Again, proof. Open your Bibles, please. Proverbs 30, verse 5. Proverbs 30, verse 5. It says, Every word of God is pure. Let me stop there. Every word of God is pure. You see that? So not only is the Bible in total the fallible word of God, but in part of to the degree that every word is the truth of God. Another verse, John 17, 17. It says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. You see that? That is very clear. So not only the Bible is infallible, not only inerrant. Number three, it is complete. It is complete. Again, we can find it here in Proverbs 30 verse 6. It says here, Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. So there needs to be nothing added. Okay? There needs to be nothing added. Now maybe that's a surprise to some people. Huh? Because there are people today who believe that we need to add the Bible. There is a certain existing sort of philosophy theology combination known as neo-orthodoxy. And they tell us that the Bible was simply a comment in its day on man's spiritual experience. And today, man is having more spiritual experiences and he needs another comment. 
Did you see that? What a twist. Okay? So, they said, they claim that the Bible is not complete. The Bible is not complete. That's a current philosophical, theological thought. But at the end of the book of the Bible, what's the last book of the Bible? The book of Revelation. Open your Bibles there. Revelation 22, 18. We read these words. Revelation 22, 18. If any man shall add to these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. Okay? And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the tree of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. So imagine, the Bible ends with a warning. It ends with a warning not to take away anything and not to add anything. That is very clear here in Revelation 22, 18. So, that's a testimony of its completeness. Okay? So, remember this. The Bible is infallible in its total. Again, it is inerrant in its parts. All right? never makes a mistake in its total presentation and in most divisible presentation. And the Bible is complete. Number four. Number four. The Bible is authoritative. The Bible is authoritative. So, listen to this. Since it is perfect, and complete, then it is the last word. And say, since it is the last word, then it is the final authority. All right? If it is if it is perfect and complete, then it is the last word. So since it is the last word, it is the final authority. That's the word of God. Proof, Isaiah 1 2. Isaiah 1 2. It says, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord hath spoken. Now, let me stop there. In other words, when God speaks, everybody listens. Okay? Why? Because His is the final authority. Now, beloved in the Lord, the Bible demands obedience. Whether you like it or not, the Bible demands obedience. The Bible discusses its implications. The Bible discusses its applications. The Bible discusses its meanings. So we should not discuss whether the Bible is true or not. You're just wasting our time. But it is very clear that the Bible is authoritative. It affirms and assumes that it is true. Okay? Open your Bibles, please, in John 8.31. John 8.31. We have the little incident here where Jesus is confronted by some of the Jewish leaders. John 8.31 And as Jesus faces these leaders, there's a little dialogue going on. And there, of course, are other people there. And it says, in the text here, that many believed on Him. Many believed on Him. No doubt, some of them were leaders. But Jesus, Jesus said to them, If you continue in my word, then you are my real disciple. Now what does this mean? In other words, 
Jesus demanded a response to his truth. You see? He demanded a response to his truth. He demanded a response to his word. This is the reason why we call that the Bible is authoritative. It is authoritative. Another verse, Galatians 3.10. Galatians 3.10 And it says here, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book, which are not written in the book of the law to do them. Galatians 3.10 Amazing! Okay? Cursed is anyone who doesn't continue in everything that is written in this book. What a tremendous claim to absolute authority. Right? Another verse, James 2.9. James 2.9. We read this, If you have respect of persons, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. Okay? In other words, to violate the Bible at one point is to break God's law. Okay? So, this is it. It is authoritative in every part. Number five, the Bible is sufficient. It is sufficient. For whatever it is in the heart of man that is necessary, the Bible is sufficient. Open your Bibles, please, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. There's a great word here, 2 Timothy 3, 15. And Paul here says to Timothy, and from, and that from a child, who is that? Timothy, okay? Thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, okay? Now look at this, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith that is in Christ Jesus. So again, it is very clear that the Bible is sufficient for our salvation. The Bible is able to make you wise unto salvation. And look at verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. What does this mean? In other words, teaching or principles of wisdom. Divine truths or divine standards. That's the word, doctrine. And then the Bible says here again, it is profitable for reproof. That means you're able to go to somebody and say, hey man, you're out of line. You can't behave like that. So you see, there is a standard. And you are not making it with that standard. And please remember that the Bible is the standard for our living. Alright? The Bible is the standard for our living. And then, not only that, it is also profitable for correction. For correction. That says to that person you've just reproved. Now, don't do that. But, do this. Okay? This is the new path. So, you teach, you reprove, you show a corrected way. And, further, it says here in verse 16, that the Bible is profitable for instruction of righteousness. Now, you point the new way and show them how to walk in it. 
This is the beauty of the Word of God, beloved in the Lord. See? That is why the Bible is a fantastic book. It can take somebody who doesn't know God, who is not saved, and save them. Right? And then it can teach them. And then it will reprove them when they do wrong. It will point to them the right thing to do. And show them how to walk in the right path. This is the word of God. And look what happened in verse 17. What's the result? If we're going to do this. Verse 17, it says that the men of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Beloved in the Lord, the incredible reality of the Bible is that it is sufficient to do the whole job. That's the incredible reality of the Bible. It is sufficient to do the whole job. It is one product that does the whole job. That's the word of God. So again, remember this. This is very simple, very basic. But please remember this. The Bible is infallible. It is inerrant. It is complete. It is authoritative. And it is sufficient. Before we go to the next one, Open your Bibles, please, in Romans 15.4. Romans 15.4. We read this. Romans 15.4. For whatever things were written in earlier times. Okay? For whatever things were written in earlier times. What is that? Of course, that has reference to the Bible. All right? That has reference to the Bible. So for whatever things were written in earlier times were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort from the scriptures might have hope. So again, the Bible is the source of patience, the source of comfort, and ultimately giving us hope now and forever. And what an incredible book. The Bible. Again, another verse. James 1.25. James 1.25. This is really a tre tremendous text. It says here, James 1.25. Whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty. What is the perfect law of liberty? Again, that's the scripture. Okay? That's the word of God. The perfect law of liberty. And continue it in it. And he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the word, this man shall be blessed. Isn't that great? Huh? Beloved in the Lord, you know when you read it, and when you do it, you are blessed. It says here in the scripture. Now, look at verse 21. Look at verse 21. James says, If we receive with meekness the engrafted word, it is able to save our lives. You know what? The Greek text literally, it means your life. Your life. In other words, it will save your life if you will receive the word of God. Would you imagine that? It will save your life if you will receive the word of God. And by that he means that it will give you the fullest, abundant, abounding life imaginable. And it is possible too for a Christian doesn't obey the word of God to lose his life. Is that true, Pastor? Yes. We have a record here in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Some of those Christians in Corinth violated the Lord's table. 
and God took them home. Sabi, no? <laughs> there was a line there in 1 Corinthians 11 that says, Some of you are weak. Some of you are sickly. And some of you even sleep. The word sleep there is, they are dead. I have a friend of mine in the seminary. He was a brilliant man. He was uh, awarded in CPU as the best orator. He is a pastor, graduate of our seminary. But I'm sorry to tell you, I will not mention his name. I will not mention also his place of assignment. But he wasted his life. He is a drug addict. He is a pastor. He is a womanizer. He is a drunkard. Name it. That's his life. He did not allow the word of God to apply it in his life. And to make the long story short, God took him. There was an incident somewhere here in Iloilo. I will not mention the place. He was shot dead. And up until now, his case was unsolved. That was 20 years ago. That was 20 years ago. So you see, <laughs> it's very dangerous. Huh? Look at Ananias and Sapphira. When they disobeyed God's command, instantly they were dropped dead in front of the whole church. That is recorded in Acts chapter 5. So James is saying here in James chapter 1, verse 21. Look at this. If you receive the engrafted word and you obey it and you continue in it, it has an incredible way of perfecting you. It has the incredible way of blessing you. It has the incredible way of saving your life. So all these things are true from the word of God. And number six, second to the last. The Bible is effective. The Bible is effective. So the word of God is effective. Again, open your Bibles please, Isaiah 55, 11. It says here, So shall my word be. I like that line. So shall my word be. Okay? Meaning, the word of God is going to work. Right? If you understand that lines, so shall my word be. Meaning, the, the word of God is going to work. That goes forth out of my mouth, it shall not return, return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please. Isn't that great? Okay? Beloved in the Lord, isn't that great? Isaiah 55, 11. Meaning, God's word is effective. It is effective. And you know, one of the incredible things about being a teacher of the word of God is that you know it will do what it says it will do. That's the incredible things about being a teacher of the word of God. You know it will do what it says it will do. Let me give you this an illustration. Just like a salesman comes into your house and he demo his product there and the product doesn't work. See that? It's a shame, right? To be caught in a situation where your product is not going to work. What a shame. <laughs> But listen to this, beloved in the Lord. That never happens in the Bible. That never happens in the Bible. It is very clear that the Bible is always effective. It is always effective. It always does exactly what it says it will do. What a tremendous reality about the Scripture. Another verse, 
First Thessalonians chapter one verse five. First Thessalonians chapter one verse five. It says, and this is a great verse about the effectiveness of the Scripture. It says here, for our gospel came not unto you in the word only. You see that lines there. When you hear the word of God, it is not just words, beloved in the Lord. Okay. He goes on to say here, but also in power, in and in the Holy Spirit, and in much assurance. Okay? 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 5. In other words, when the word goes forth, it has power. It has the Holy Spirit. And you can have the assurance it will do what it says. That's a great truth of the word of God. So again, let me recap this before I close. The word of God is infallible in total. It is inherent in its parts. Okay? Inherent in its parts. Complete so that nothing is to be diminished or to be added to it. It is authoritative, so that whatever it says is absolutely true and commands our obedience. And the Bible is sufficient, so that it is able to do to us and for us everything we need. And the Bible is effective. It will do exactly what it says it will do. That's the word of God. Lastly, the Bible is determinative. The Bible is determinative. In other words, how you respond to the word of God is the determiner of your life and your eternity. Open your Bibles, please. John 8, 47. In John 8, 47, it says, He that is of God hears God's word. Okay? Did you get that? He that is of God hears God's words. It's in the plural there. Ye therefore hear them not, Jesus said, because ye are not of God. Now, what does this mean? John 8, 47. In other words, it is a determiner of whether an individual is of God or of not or not of God based on whether they listen to the word of God. 1 Corinthians 2:9. 1 Corinthians 2:9 it says, I had not seen nor ear heard neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God had prepared for them that love him. Now here, man could never know what God had prepared. Okay? Man could never conceive of God's dominion. Man could never conceive that he would be part of it. Man could never conceive in his own humanness, in his own human mind, and in his own patterns of logic all that God has prepared for him but look at verse 10 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 10 it says God has revealed to them to us by his spirit for what man knoweth the things of a man except the spirit of man which is in him even so the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God now we have received not the spirit of the world but the Spirit who is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. And look at verse 14. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. So here you have two separate kinds of people. The people who receive the things of God and the people who do not. And the unbelieving people, they cannot receive it. 
Okay? Why? Because they don't have the Holy Spirit. See? The human mind cannot handle it. But the people of God, but the people who know God, they have the Holy Spirit. So they receive the Word of God. You see, it is a determiner. The Bible is a determiner. So those people who receive the Word of God indicate by the very understanding of the Word of God that they possess the Holy Spirit and that proves them to be believers. In conclusion of this study, beloved in the Lord, this is God's holy word. Okay? The Bible is God's holy word. A tremendous thing. And the Christian who never approaches it with an intense commitment to study is forfeiting a tremendous blessing. That is why I encourage you to bring your Bible. Love the Word. Love the Word. Read it. Study it. Meditate upon it. And above all, apply it in your life. Apply it in your life. So the deeper I study the Word of God, the more I get excited of it. How about you? I hope that would be a challenge to all of us. Love the Word of God. Let us pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your Word. We thank you for the truths that we have seen. It is so simple, very basic, but a lot of us are not knowledgeable about these truths. So help us, Lord, to obey your word, above all, to apply it in our lives. We thank you for the great truths that we have learned this morning. We bring back the honor and glory to you. In Christ's most precious name, amen.